So I was, oh, thank you. I was actually thinking it's my first um, Mother's Day without any children in my house. Um, been blessed that even when they got married, they just brought people back with them, you know. <laughs> they kind of thankfully didn't do it all at the same time, but did it in rotation. And so this is our my first Mother's Day that I've woken up and I haven't been adorned with gifts and flowers and love. <laughs> um, which actually hasn't happened any Mother's Day, but you know, hey, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm staring. It's actually my first Mother's Day that I haven't tripped over a zillion shoes. Um, those basketball high tops um, before I got to a door. So, um, yeah, but um, I know that this is not an easy day for lots of people. And um, even men in here who have suffered loss and um, suffered loss of moms, wives, the women in your life, um, you've suffered incredible loss. And maybe for both men and women, there's loss of what you thought would be. For some of the mums in here, I know there's fractured relationships and um, for some of our girls, it's a little bit too hard to be here today, hey. Um, And that's okay. Um, They may be watching online, just maybe couldn't be in the house today, but um, I just, my heart wouldn't be that they would know that they're seen and they're loved. And for some of the older women, maybe you can't be here physically because of where you are um, situated. Um, But can I just speak to you that your influence is no less of where it is that you're living, your influence, your love, your words and your prayers. You may be in a living space that wouldn't necessarily be the one you want to be in, but please don't lose sight of who you are and your influence in your family's lives and the people around your lives. This series, Encountering Jesus, I have loved it. And um, actually, Easter, I feel like I'm still living in Easter, loved it. And um, if you haven't listened to the messages, could I encourage you to do so um, or re-listen to them um, if you have. Um, Today, I just want to follow on with that theme and share briefly about another person's encounter with Jesus as told to us in Mark's gospel. But just before I turn to it, um, would you go with me for a moment so we can understand the premise of that time? I mean, we're talking Israel being under Roman rule, which was brutal, to say the least. It was brutal. The Jews were oppressed. They were despised. Their faith and culture was seen as inferior. And in turn, the Jews despised the Romans. The Romans were to them unclean. Their culture was unclean. Their pagan religion and the power they had over their daily life. So into that premise, you've got to put yourself back in that place. Um, the daily living for Jews, um, they were meant to not only keep the Torah, but the 600 plus man-made rules that were imposed upon them by self-righteous leaders. So not are you you only living under like a brutal regime um, where you're treated low, the lowest to the low, but you are also trying to live up to um, a religious standard that's not necessarily a God standard. Try to imagine carrying the weight of this legalism, knowing that you could never be pure enough, you can never be holy enough, you can't be blameless enough, you, you literally cannot be enough. And then, here you are a woman who again is inferior, you're confined, rules meant like living in your father's house or maybe living under your husband's rule, but there was rules, so you were confined. You were without authority and you were not credible. And this is the premise of where I want to share this from today. And as a woman in that situation, 
one step again, you're chronically, you're ill. You're chronically ill. And you have been for years and years and years, and you're isolated. And you're shamed. You're excluded from every part of life. You can't be in the community. You can't go to the temple. You can't be in any of those situations. In fact, anything you touch or anything, any person you touch becomes ruined um, because of your situation and where you are. And you're spent, like you're literally spent. You're spent physically, emotionally, financially, and you're exhausted. You're broke. You've spent it all looking for a cure and for some relief. And this woman who had searched for an answer to her illness for years, the word says under doctor's care only worsened. But now you find yourself in a thick crowd where you can't but help touch others. You're not supposed to be touching anything, but you can't help but touch others in the crowd. And you don't want to stop him for he's on a mission with someone far greater than you. You know your social standing. You know your place. You know you shouldn't be in the crowd, let alone be seeking him. And he's speaking with someone of a higher rank, a higher standing in society. He's on a mission. You don't want to call out his name. And, but you don't want to be seen, but you just need to touch him. You need to touch him because you're desperate. You're desperate. You're hopeful. You have some faith. And I wonder what this woman had heard about Jesus that brought her to this place, that literally gave her the courage to be in the crowd, gave her the courage to leave the house, gave her the courage to try again, gave her the courage that she's going to be seen by people that know her situation, but she's going to walk it anyway. She's going to be in the crowd. Gave her the courage to risk touching others to get to him. I would love to think that for this woman that a friend had sat outside her window or her door of her house and repeated what she'd already seen and heard about Jesus. Even me writing that line hit me here. Have I sat outside a friend's window or door and told them what I know about Jesus to a friend that's confined? And I wondered if what she said was enough to seed hope and life into this woman's heart. Were the words and love and grace and mercy of Jesus, were they enough to create a level of faith and hope in her life? Maybe just enough for her to act on. I wonder if her friend might have repeated these words of Jesus in Matthew 11, 28 to 30 where Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Dane Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. He talks about that Jesus in this passage, nowhere else does it mention it in the gospel or any other kind of red letter writing about Jesus, but Jesus in this passage literally reveals the very heart of himself. Jesus literally opens to up, up to us his heart. And we get to peer way down into the core of who he is. The very center of who he is. 
And when Jesus tells us what animates him most deeply, what is most true of him, when he exposes the innermost recesses of his being, what we find there is gentle and lowly. Not arrogance of heart, not superiority of heart, not, um, not even a knowing, though he knows it all, but what he reveals about his heart that is gentle and lonely. Who could have ever thought up such a savior? And he says, I am gentle. Not harsh, not reactionary, not easily exasperated. The posture most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but it's open arms and lowly. Interesting word, hey, some of our versions humble. It's very, very easily translated. And the point of Jesus saying that he was lowly is that Jesus was accessible. For all his resplendent glory and dazzling holiness, his supreme uniqueness and otherness, no one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus Christ. No prerequisites, no hoops to jump through, no anything that you have to do before you come to him. No other ruler, no other, even today, no other leader. You go and visit with one of these leaders, you're going to have to do a whole lot of prerequisites, a whole lot of hoop jumping, a whole lot of things to make yourself presentable. None of that, none of that. And your very burden what you carry, whatever it is you carry now that you're concerned about, you're holding and it's hard and it's exhausting and you're spent, your very burden is what is your prerequisite, is actually what qualifies you to come. It's literally what qualifies you to come to him. So would you turn with me to Mark 5, 21 to 34 while we just read this passage of scripture, scripture this morning. I realized I didn't pray before I started, but I love that my husband prayed for you all. <laughs> and, um, and please note, this is not just a message to women. It's not a message to moms or grandmothers. Or, um, because before any of that, he sees you as an individual and a daughter. To the men in the room, he sees you as a son. He sees you as an individual. So don't, don't, don't discard that I'm talking about probably primarily a woman today, but he sees you as an individual. So in Mark 5, 21, 34. When Jesus went back across to the other side of the lake, a large gathered, sorry, a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Again, put yourself in the premise. Don't read that really quickly. A leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, Come and, sorry, came and fell down before him, pleading with him to heal his little daughter. She is about to die, he said in desperation. Please come and place your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. And Jesus went with him and the crowd thronged behind him. And there was a woman in the crowd. So again, we're back to our premise. She can see Jesus is already on a mission. And she's on a mission with someone far greater than her. This is a man who would have been wealthy, high locals, you know, high status in society. People would have known who he was. So here she is in the crowd, and I'm sure she's thinking, he's not going to see me in the crowd. <laughs> but should I even try? Because he's already going. Why would I get it, put yourself there, why would, I, why would I interfere with the mission that is on? I don't know him, I've heard of him. What would be um, racing through her heart is that happened. And Jesus went with him and the crowd thronged behind him and there was a woman in the crowd who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. Seriously, even that length of time, she would, she would have just been like physically to even get there would have been beyond, let alone stand in a crowd of people, like, and then move with a crowd of people. And she had suffered a great deal from many doctors through the years and had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she was worse. And she'd heard about Jesus. So she came. 
She came up behind him through the crowd. Again, she's touching people. She shouldn't. She shouldn't. By law, by every religious decree, she shouldn't be near people. She shouldn't be touching anybody. And she's pushing through the crowd. And she touched the fringe of his robe. Bertha thought to herself, was if I can just touch his clothing, I will be healed. Immediately, immediately the bleeding stopped. And she could feel that she had been healed. Wouldn't you have loved at that point that I've been healed and I can just like quietly escape, you know? But Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him. Jesus realized at once the healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around to the crowd and he said, who touched my clothes? And the disciples said to him, and all this crowd, all this crowd is pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? They didn't understand that there'd already been this incredible encounter. And, um, but Jesus kept on looking to see who had done it. Don't you love that? He's supposed to be on mission. They're supposed to all be moving. They're also supposed to go into Jairus' house. He's the man of importance. His daughter is dying. This is what they're supposed to do. And Jesus stops and he searches for the one that touched him. But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, again, she now owns up and she owns up. Everyone's going to know that she's been there. Everyone knows her situation. She literally has to come out into the public space. She was trembling at the realization of what had happened to her. She came and fell at his feet and told him what she had done. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You have been healed. And while he was still speaking to her, I don't have this on the screen, messengers arrived from Jairus' house with the news that his daughter had died. She was now dead. There's no use us troubling the teacher now. So think of that for Jairus. If he hadn't have stopped, if she hadn't have done what she'd done, she shouldn't have been here. Why would she be here? She has no right. If he hadn't have done that, they, this is, they were on their way to his house for his, his daughter, his family. I love Jesus' response. He stops knowing the power had gone out from him. She broke the law by touching Jesus. Jesus, by law, was now ritually unclean by her touch. Oh, but he broke the law by talking to her. I love that. He tenderly speaks to her and he calls her daughter in amongst this public place, he calls her, her daughter and he declares that her faith has made her whole. Theologian Warren Wiesby quotes about this, that Jesus responds to faith, no matter how feeble it might be. And when we believe, he shares his power with us and something happens in our lives. Why would, say it again, <laughs> Jesus responds to faith, no matter how feeble it is, when we believe, he shares his power with us, and something happens in our lives. Why would Jesus deal with her so publicly? He knows the situation, he knows the law of the day, he knows all about that. I think firstly it was for her sake. Not only did he want her to know him as healer, but he wanted her to know him as saviour, as friend, as the one that literally locked eyes with her and looked into her face, saw that she was known, saw that she was seen in amongst the crowd. 
And the line that she, her faith had healed you, some of the versions say she was made whole. What an incredible line for any of us. She was made whole. Physical healing, but she also received something far greater, spiritual healing. I think it was also for the sake of Jairus. The encounter had delayed Jesus getting to his daughter who was near death, but he needed encouragement. He needed his faith to be strengthened. It was for the sake of the crowd. Her life is now a witness. I wrote, ha, huh, as when I wrote that. I'm like, ha, huh, I love that about Jesus. This woman's life was now a testimony that could be trusted. We're talking a woman who couldn't even be in a court, who couldn't speak because her words wouldn't have been trusted. Now she has a testimony where she's encountered Jesus one-on-one -on -one, and there's no denying her testimony in that crowd. There's no denying um, her trust. I love that about Jesus. There's this beautiful Anne Voskamp quote. It says, what people label God loves and who gets written off? Jesus writes their name on the palms of his hands. And when we, we fall way too short, too far short of being enough, God makes the way to move into us and be in our home. I don't know if there's something that you are carrying this morning, today. I don't know if you've carried it for the length of time that this woman has. But does your faith feel a little bit feeble about it? I know mine does, times. Maybe you're not even sure that you have faith. You know what built her faith was hearing about Jesus. She, she didn't even see the seeing, because she couldn't at that time, but the hearing. So if you're a Jesus follower, what was it that drew you near to Jesus? What did you hear about him? What have you seen? What has he spoken to you? If you're um, not sure about faith, not sure about Jesus, hearing his words this morning, pray that that would just kind of open up your eyes a bit to consider and to think about him. But for you that know his words, can you trust him again with whatever it is that you're carrying? Can you step out and push through to be the one reaching out and pursuing him? Can you be encouraged again today? Again, knowing your very burden is what qualifies you to come, knowing. So whatever it is you're carrying, it may be illness, it may be hurt. Seriously, it may be angry, anger. You may be angry at, angry at something for a very long time. You may be ticked, I don't know, it could be something in your job, something happened that was really unfair. It could be betrayal from a friend, huge disappointment, maybe. This isn't how I thought things would turn out. Jesus wants to make you whole, okay? He wants to make you whole. He wants to make you whole. He wants to free you from that burden you're carrying. He wants to free you from whatever it is that you're facing. So as Beck comes this morning... Again, this is not a girl's thing. I love that we honor our girls, but we're here to glorify Jesus. This is, you know, the purpose of why we gather. And, gather, and, and in that time, Jesus comes to us, speaks to us, and he speaks to us about the really core issues in our life because he wants to make you whole. I've said it before, the greatest gift I can give my children, the greatest gift I can give you as a friend or the people I work with 
is that I allow Jesus to change me and deal with the stuff in my life. I don't want to, I don't want to pass it down another generation. My anger or my hurt or my disappointment. I want, I want Jesus to make me whole in those areas so that I'm free. And when I interact with people, they don't wear my stuff, hey? They don't wear our stuff. They wear Jesus. Jesus' freedom and wholeness. Thanks, Beth. The worship team could come this morning. I love the thought in this passage that she touched his robe. Don't lose that or miss that significance. Mark wouldn't have written it in his gospel if it wasn't significant that she touched his robe. It didn't, the, the corner of his robe, it doesn't say that she went and touched his hand. It didn't say that she went through and she just, you know, lent her body on him. She specifically went in and reached for the corner of his robe. Why? I think if I knew that Jesus was coming in, I wouldn't go for his robe. Honestly, I think I'd go for his hand. Like, he, you know, the right hand, that's where all the power is. We know the right hand of God. We know the strong arm of the Lord. I would have gone for his hand. But this woman went for his robe, and there is a reason why. The robes that uh, Jesus would have been wearing in those days, the corners were called wings. They were from the Hebrew word uh, kanaf, and the zitzits, they're called, T-Z-I, here we go, let me get it right, T-Z-I-T, Z-I-T, the, the zitzits, the tassels, the corners, would be on the end of the robe. Here is what Malachi would say in this messianic promise about the Savior. He says, for you who revere my name, go ahead and play you guys, thanks. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, with healing in his kanaf, with healing in the corner of his robe. So when she reaches out for Jesus, she is going for where she knows his authority and power according to the promise of the word of God. There's got to be something just even in his clothes that I can reach. And so as we come to this end today, we're going to uh, pray for all our girls. But before we do, we want to pray for healing this morning. We want to pray for those men and women in this building this morning who you need a touch from Jesus. You need a physical or emotional or a spiritual. There is healing. If you were to look at your life, there are issues that you are not whole in an area and you need Jesus. Here's the good news. The Son of, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, has risen <laughs> with healing in His wings. And He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Jesus that healed her chronic illness is here today to heal you of your sickness and your pain. So would you stand? If you need healing, would you stand if you need to reach out to the Savior today? Come on, that woman had to come in amongst the crowd. She had to go past being embarrassed. She had to reach out for Jesus. I'm going to give you a minute. I don't want you to miss this. We've got some people online that um, at home with COVID this morning. We're standing on your behalf this morning. Jesus, in your very room, in your very lounge rooms. Would you reach out to Him just like that woman did? Would you reach out to Him? Father God, we thank You today that You, you are the God who heals. We thank you that when you died on the cross, Jesus, that you bore our sickness and our disease, that once for all time, you took our sin, you took our pain, you took our shame, and you nailed it to that cross. 
And so today we can come to you just like that woman did in faith, knowing that you are the God who heals. You are the God who delivers. You are the God who makes whole. Oh, we trust you. And Lord God, even even many of us have been to many different places for healing. We've been to doctors. We've been to all the specialists, Lord God, and frustration still abides. And I pray, Lord God, that even today that we would, our faith would be renewed to press into you. In the name of Jesus. Would you begin to thank him this morning? Begin to thank him for that healing. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. As you take your seats, every woman in this place, would you stand this morning? All our girls. You are precious to us. We are a blessed people because you are amongst us. Would you look around at these stunning women? (laughs) Beautiful. And you are what makes us us. And today, we want to just speak the blessing of God over you. Just like Jesus knew the chronic illness that that woman was facing. Before she even touched him, he knew. That's why he was looking. And Jesus is looking at you this morning. And he knows what you're facing. And he has you on his mind today. Would you just... Stretch your hands out, and we're going to pray a blessing over all our girls today. Would you, men, while you're sitting, would you just stretch your hands towards one of the women near you? Father God, we, we pray a blessing on these beautiful women today in the name of Jesus. I ask, Lord God, where they are weary, I pray that they would get fresh strength. I ask, Lord God, where there's sickness, where there's things that they're facing, that you would bring healing and wholeness. I thank you that the blessing of the Lord brings rich and doesn't add any sorrow with it. And so I ask, Lord God, that there would be an abundance of mercy and grace over our women today. Lord God, I pray that every, everything of anger and frustration, everything that wants to turn their head in a different direction than turning to you, Let it be gone in the name of Jesus. And I ask, Lord God, that they would lift their eyes to see you, to see your goodness and to see your truth. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you all stand?